reading scripture, let us begin with a prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word that we're about to read. And as we read it, we ask that you would move on our hearts by your spirit. That our hearts and our minds be illumined to its meaning. That we would be understanders and doers of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first passage comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9. <laughs> Starting with verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of a tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood, will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And then in the New Testament from Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. A minister preached a sermon, and it was obvious to him about halfway through that it was a dud because half the people were asleep, the other half were digging through their pocketbooks looking for gum, something like that. <laughs> Children were all restless. And make matters worse, when he was at the door at the end, shaking hands, nobody said a word to him. He was completely silent. <laughs> Except for this one little old lady at the end, who always had something nice to say. She shook his hand and said, I think that sermon was like the peace of God. And he said, well, that sounds wonderful. He said, why do you say that? He said, well, like the peace of God, it was beyond understanding and endured forever. <laughs> so, hopefully my servants aren't like that. <laughs> the second Sunday of Advent is the, uh, the Sunday of peace, and we'll talk about peace today. Uh, but if we look around in the world, we don't see much peace. You know, every year we read this particular prophecy from the book of Isaiah about this time. It's a time of Christmas reading that we do, and it talks about uh, who the Messiah would be when he was born, and one of the Names one of the titles given him as Prince of Peace. The Messiah was to bring peace when he came. And of course, we believe that Jesus is that Messiah and that he is the Prince of Peace. But then people look around in the world and they see, well, there is no peace. And that might be one of the reasons some people say, why do I, would I believe in that? Because the Messiah was supposed to bring peace, but there is no peace to be found. And we can look at the world and see that, you know, that certainly seems to be the case. You know, internationally, we can look and see of at least two major wars we know going on, one in Ukraine, one in Gaza, uh, and then you know probably a dozen other smaller ones. Uh, and the fact that they're smaller doesn't mean much to the folks who are affected by those conflicts and wars. They're as major to them as a major war is. Uh, so we can look and see that there's not much peace between nations. Even within countries, some countries have you know, armed civil war going on or large groups of bandits moving about and, and causing disruption. Even in our own country, we don't have armed conflict, but still yet, uh, you know, people are at their, each other's throats more than uh, in my lifetime that I remember. Uh, 
Uh, and when we read in the newspapers, we can certainly see that, you know, communities and families and individuals and workplaces, a lot of them certainly don't seem to be having much peace either. There seems to be a lot of conflict around and about. It seems as if uh, we're kind of like the fella in Kentucky right before the Civil War when they asked him which side he would fight for. And he said, well, I'll be with Kentucky. He says, if Kentucky, uh, you know, is, is whatever Kentucky does, I'll go with it. So, but if Kentucky be torn apart, then I'm going to go with Bullock County. And if Bullock County is torn apart, then I'm with Shepherdsville. And if Shepherdsville gets torn apart, then by golly, I'm for my side of the street. <laughs> and so uh, I think sometimes, unfortunately, that's the way we are in this world. We're ready for our side of the street come, you know, whatever. <laughs> We're ready to pick a side and fight and fight it out. But we might ask ourselves, why is there no peace? That is a good question. The Prince of Peace has come. I think we can look and see, uh, of course, that the early Christians didn't expect that there would be peace until Jesus returned again. They knew there would be conflict until the end of time. As Paul tells us, that, that conflict and series of conflicts in the world are kind of like birth pains. You know, as, a, as the birth nears, the birth pains grow stronger and closer together. So two uh, bad things seem to, to go uh, to be worse and to be much closer together than they used to be, whether that's true or whether it's a matter of communication and our ability to get news as quickly as we do, I don't know. But the book of Revelation, which we're also studying, which is also something I guess we'll do Thursday morning. I didn't make the announcement of that. We have our, uh, Bible, our Bible study on Thursday at 11 o'clock. But in the book of Revelation, we're shown, you know, conflict and evil at its height and at the pitch of its strength. Uh, but what it, Revelation does show us as well is that in the end, Jesus Christ and his peace will reign. But the main reason there is no peace now, I think, is as the French philosopher and mathematician said 400 years ago, and his words are as good today as they were then, that most of the trouble in this world is caused by folks who can't sit in a room by themselves and just be quiet. And I think that's probably true. Because there's no peace out here when there's no peace in here and no peace here. You know, if there's no peace in here or here, you can't sit in a room by yourself and be quiet. you got to go do something that you can end up being in somebody else's business and causing trouble. Um, and that seems to be a, the trouble. The only really way to have peace, of course, here and here is to make peace with God as well, uh, to have that peace. And, of course, that's what we see Jesus as having done, is having brought that peace. As the Prince of Peace, he brought the ultimate peace. And that is the idea of peace that is greater than our idea as humans of peace. You know, as, as humans, we have the idea of peace that is simply the absence of conflict. The absence of conflict is a good thing. As Benjamin Franklin said, you know, I'd rather have the, the worst uh, peace than the best war. You know, absence of conflict is a good thing. But it's not, however, always peaceful, is it? Uh, there can be no conflict, but there can be no conflict because maybe somebody rules with our hand, and there's no justice. And if there's no justice, there's no peace. And so, uh, you know, our human ideas of, of peace can be shallow. But the idea of God's peace is summed up in the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom is often used as a greeting in, in Israel. You hear somebody say, hello or goodbye, shalom. They're, what they're doing is wishing peace on one another. I wish you peace, shalom. But it is more than just a greeting. Shalom is more than just the word peace. Shalom is God's peace. Everything as God would have it to be. All justice done, all needs taken care of, uh, all problems ceased, peace at hand, Love at hand, mercy and grace at hand, everything as God would have it to be in his perfect world. That's quite a blessing for the stone center when you say shalom to them. You're wishing all these wonderful things upon them. But we believe that Christ brought that shalom. He brought that peace to us. And we can see that because in the New Testament, in the book of John, when Jesus is on the cross, he says, it is finished. And the word he would have spoken in Aramaic which the language he spoke was shalom. It is shalom. Shalom means it is finished, but it means also God's peace is at hand now. Everything has been shalom, made God's peace through what he has done. All justice is taken care of. All debts are paid. Love is at hand in fullness. Everything that God would wish is possible. Christ brought that shalom to us in this world. 
And what we have to do is to accept it and live. That's easier said than done, but it's also not hard either <laughs> because we choose it. We choose to live in that shalom or that peace or not. I took a class once on a particular uh, psychological method, a, a method of therapy. The one thing they said in there really struck me. It was that in the world, you have your own basic makeup as to whether you're basically happy or not. Then you have things that happen around you, good things and bad things can make you happy or sad. But all that added together really makes a balance. And in the end, it is what you choose that pushes you whether to be positive or into the negative. We choose our shalom, or we choose not to. Oftentimes, we get involved in something before we realize it, and we need to stop and think, is there shalom in this situation? If not, how can I bring it? Rather than get involved in the squabble. You, know? uh, you go, particularly this time of year, you end up going to Walmart somewhere, and somebody cuts in front of you in line, or standing where you need to get something. Uh, you know, they may cuss at you or be at you in the parking lot. And before you know it, you're ready to turn around and just get them on floor. <laughs> but, you know, that is our reaction. We can't, you know, dictate the way things happen in the world. But we can about how we respond to it. And do we respond with God's shalom or not? We choose it. And so each day we should stop and think in the situation we're in, is this shalom? Are we choosing shalom? Do we live by shalom? We can or we can't. It's up to us. I know that's not very Presbyterian where things are talking about predestined. You know, you're predestined to be this way. But even as John Calvin would say, that doesn't excuse you from choosing what's right and good. Uh, we still choose whether we live in God's shalom or not, and whether we extend that to others or not. In closing, there was a, a king who uh, had a contest to see who could paint a picture of perfect peace. And in the end, it came down to two paintings done by masters in his kingdom. It was a picture of a beautiful, placid lake. It had beautiful water that was still, and the trees were blooming, and you couldn't hear a painting, of course, but if you could, it would seem like the birds were singing. It was certainly a picture of peace. People looked at it and said, yeah, it's very peaceful. The other picture, at initial glance, seemed to be the opposite of that. There were storm clouds in the background, and there was a huge, rushing, booming waterfall in the present future of it, the front of it, and it's like, that doesn't look very peaceful. But then in the middle of it, on a tree branch stretched out over the waterfall was a nest. In the nest were little birds, and the mother bird was there amidst her children. She had her arms around them, her wings around them, protecting them. And people in the end said, yes, that's true peace. Because we can't tell what's going on around us. We can't dictate that. And like in that picture, it could be thundering waterfalls and a storm coming. But the peace in that nest was true and perfect because that mother made it so. And so it is with us. We may live with waterfalls around us and storms coming, but we can also live with God's perfect shalom, which Jesus has given to us as a gift if we but take it and live in it. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the peace that Christ has made for us. Help us, Lord, to live in that peace, peace that has been made with you, peace that we should be making with one another, Help us, Lord, daily to choose your shalom, to stop and think before we get involved in things about how we live within it. Are we living within shalom in this moment? In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.